next, next up, we are going to take questions from the press. And Mr. Kennedy is going to be joined by Bishop Mendez and former Chief Border Patrol Chris Clem. <laughs> Believe it or not, after that, uh, well, we're going to show a short film. And then after that, Mr. Kennedy is going to take selfies with each and every one of you. Okay, and now we're ready for our questions, and here comes Mr. Kennedy, Bishop Mendez, and former Patrol Chief Chris Clem. Okay, first question, please. Good evening. Mr. Kennedy, I want to thank you for coming to Los Angeles. It's a pleasure to see you here today. My name is Benito Benny Bernal. I represent Chi Americanos. Uh, it's a group of uh, organization that is made up of Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Recently, I just got back from a trip from Washington, D.C. about two months ago. I'm glad that you're covering the issues on the border, but one of the things that was not mentioned, and I would like to know what your plan is with this, over the years, we have had highly trained militants that have come through the border from Russia, from China, from Valenzuela, who are here to destroy our country. What would your plan be to, number one, identify where these individuals are, capture them, and then put them in prison? Thank you for the question. And I am actually going to um, uh, be taking advice from Chief Chris Clem on that issue. I mean, why, you know, there, there's a couple of issues. One is, is drugs. And, um, and the drug smuggling. A lot of the drugs coming across right now are, is fentanyl. They have all kinds of ingenious ways, like we talked about on the film, of delivering the fentanyl over here. And we're never going to be able to stop the fentanyl I imports. We, well, I have a plan for how to deal with addiction in this country, and it's going to be my Peace Corps you know, initiative. But fentanyl is uh, one two hundredth. The, the size of a opiate molecule. So you could bring in enough fentanyl in a, in, a, in a briefcase to kill everybody in Los Angeles. And we're never gonna be able to stop that. We have to change our, you know, the way that we're handling drugs in this country. We need a completely different philosophy and one that's based on good health, community, restoring um, uh, public health, mental health in this country and, and a and restoring a sense of community in this country because it's the alienation of our kids that is driving them to use these drugs and to overdose 106,000 last year. And, and the, the same roots that are, are bringing the drugs in are the roots that you're talking about yes, sir. in which you have people who are bad people who, are, who mean harm to our country. Yes, sir. And I, I'm going to, when I get into office, I'm going to be taking advice from this man here as to how to <laughs> deal with that issue. And I'd love Chris to respond to the question. Well, no, I appreciate it. And that's a very important question for everybody to understand. You're talking about people from special interest countries that really don't have good intentions uh, uh, towards the United States. And it, the fact is, is those people are coming in. We've had over 150 people on our terrorist watch list being apprehended by Border Patrol, but trying to come in between the ports of entry. What, what the problem is, is these databases that we're checking them on, it really, if there's, no, if there's no relationship with that country or it is a very cold relationship, like we're not gonna get any information from them. So right. our databases are gonna come back with little to nothing, so they're, ultimately what's happening right now is they're being released. So what we need to do is we need to detain those folks until we can do proper vetting so they're not released into our communities because there are a lot of single adults coming from countries that really don't like us. And if they're getting released in our country, we can only know what could possibly happen. So we need to detain them until we have 100% confidence that they are somebody that is not gonna do us harm. Good answer, thank you. Uh, good evening. Oop, did this one up. Uh, Senator Kennedy, my name is David Hernandez. I have a talk show on AM 870, The Answer, uh, the Los Angeles Hispanic Republican Club. David Hernandez, right over here. And we first met uh, when we were trying to fight SB 277. We met at the Nation of Islam with Tony Muhammad, and that's when uh, I first started questioning the safety of the vaccines. And a lot has transpired since then. 
And unfortunately, it has still fallen on many deaf ears. And one of the things that I could not live in good conscience with is to have an industry that is immune from liability for the damages they have caused to the American people. So as president, will you work with us to eliminate that immunity from the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, I, I, will, I will certainly submit legislation to do that, but in order to do that, because that's part of the 1986 uh, Vaccine Injury Compensation Act, that immunity provision, and I will not be able to do that without the help of Congress. And I want to take much quicker action, and I have a whole suite of actions that I'm going to do in the first week I'm in office that in order to, that will inform the American public, give them a true understanding of the risks and costs of those products. And the way to do, you know, at this point, there's no way to make that assessment because the NIH will not release that data. And they will not allow access to the databases. You can do those studies very, very quickly. The biggest database in this, in this country for vaccine injuries is called the Vaccine Safety Database. It has the, the records of all the top 10 HMOs. It has all the vaccination records and all the public health, the health claims. So claims for diabetes, for seizures, or um, for ASD, for uh, treatments of allergies, et cetera. And we now, those, those databases are digitalized. So you can do a study on them in hours. You can look and you can look to a cluster analysis artificial intelligence and find out exactly what the safety profile of every one of these products are. And I, we, no American knows the safety profile of those products because those studies have never been done and the information's never been released. And we need to know that so people can make an intelligent decision about the risks and benefits and understand that the vaccine product they take is actually averting more problems than it's causing. And, I, and so that's one of the things I think. Thank you. I've I, I got a lot of other stuff that I've talked about publicly. I've given a lot of thought about what needs to be done. I'm going to go to NIH, and I'm going to make sure, I'm going to, I'm going to assemble everybody in NIH. NIH has a budget of $42 billion a year. It gives that money, distributes them to 56,000 scientists around our country at universities to do studies on public health. And they mainly now do development of pharmaceutical drugs. They're an incubator for new drugs. And they study infectious disease, which is very profitable for the pharmaceutical industry. And what I'm going to say to them is we're going to give infectious disease and drug development a little break. And we're going to start studying, finding out what is causing the, the chronic disease epidemic in this country. Why, why do we have the sickest country in the world? We have the highest chronic disease burden of any nation in the world beginning in 1989. We went from my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. By 2006, 54%. When Congress said to EPA, what year did it start? EPA said 1989. And we got, you know, that year we got um, we, we got these neuro this cascade of neurological diseases, ASD, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism, all exploded. Autism rates went from 1 in 10,000 in my generation to 1 in 34 in my kids' generation. We suddenly saw peanut allergies, food allergies, anaphylaxis, um, and, and, and um, asthma explode. I, diseases that I did not know when I was a kid. And then this pandemic of autoimmune diseases, suddenly juvenile diabetes appeared, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Crohn's disease, lupus, all of these different autoimmune diseases that became epidemic in our children. What happened? Why don't we know the answer to that question? Because that's <laughs> it. And I'll tell you something. The, during the pandemic, we have 
we had the highest body count from COVID of any country in the world. So we have 4.2 percent of the of the globe's population. Why did we have 16 percent of the of the COVID deaths? 16 percent. Well, you know, people are getting medals and awards, or the, their management. We had the worst record of any nation on earth. We were told. Haiti and Nigeria were going to get wiped out by COVID because they didn't get any vaccines. They had a 1% vaccine rate. What happened there? They never got a pandemic. They had, uh, uh, the, 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 and Haiti, and, and Haiti, and, and Haiti had 15 COVID deaths per million population. In Nigeria, 14. We had 3,000. We had 200 times the death rate of those countries. Somebody needs to explain that. Oh, so we had the highest death rate, 16% of the deaths. And what CDC says is that the average American who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic diseases. So they had obesity, they had asthma, they had diabetes, and one other. And so what was really killing them was chronic disease. The COVID just pushed them off the edge. And, you know, we have the highest health care costs in the world, too, $4.3 trillion a year. We got three or four times per capita what any other country does, and we have the worst health outcomes. We're 79th behind Cuba, Nicaragua, Mongolia. Oh, you know, why don't we know the answer to those questions? Why isn't somebody studying that? And the reason is this. The things that are causing chronic disease, which is the poison in our food from the big agricultural pesticides. The, the, the poison in our water, the poison in our medicines, including the vaccines, which, you know, which exploded. We went from three vaccines that I had to 72 vaccines mandated for our children at that time period. And we need to find out which one of those things, and maybe it's all of them are doing this to our kids because, uh, you know, we're the, we, we have the highest cost of uh, 4.3 trillion, as I said, 80% of that goes to chronic disease. When my uncle was president, only 6% of us had chronic disease and we were paying 122nd of what we now pay of our GDP for healthcare. And, our, and we were a much uh, healthier nation. So, you know, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to clean up our food so we're actually eating nutrients rather than fillers with poison. And our medicine. And thank you for your question. Thank you, because you have a room full of medical freedom warriors sitting here that have been in this battle a long time. And yeah. I respect your courage for stepping out when you did, because I know that came at a big cost. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, name's Tara with 180 Shift. Um, when I was 18, Planned Parenthood pressured me into scheduling an abortion in their counseling. Um, last minute, I didn't go through with it. I, I walked away from my abortion appointment. And um, a, Catholic, um, a Catholic organization called Sisters for Life helped me get back on my feet and um, out of a tough situation, and my daughter is four years old now and thriving. Praise God. But, um, so in regards to the border, though, you know, your views shifted when you saw the humanitarian crisis. So my question is to you is, what is stopping your views from shifting in regards to abortion and having a more anti-abortion stance, which many Hispanic Catholics believe is a humanitarian crisis? Um, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very happy about your baby and about your decision. Um, I believe that every abortion is a tragedy. I believe that, you know, people um, who, uh, who oppose abortion, that they need to be ex respected and that we need to be able to have a congenial, respectful debate about that issue. I, I have fought my entire life for medical freedom, for people, for, they, for people to have bodily autonomy, to make sure that the government is not telling us what medical treatments we can and cannot have. 
And I understand, I understand the abortion issue is complex and that um, it is, uh, it, it's a difficult issue for all of us. Where I come down on the issue is that I don't trust the government to tell us, you know, what we can and cannot do. I think um, we ultimately, you know, and I, no solution is a good one, but I think we ultimately just have to trust women. We have to trust mothers. And, and it's a decision that, you know, has to be between ultimately the mother and her pastor, her spiritual advisors, and, uh, and the medical profession. Um, you know, people who are, who they, who that woman trusts to advise her and that, you know, we should not have government bureaucrats making those decisions. So I, you know, I also believe that it's really important for our government to support mothers who want to bring their babies to term but have economic problems. And, that, and I, you know, I intend to make that one of the priorities of my administration, because I believe every abortion is a tragedy. Amen. Thank you. Next question, right there. Thank you. Um, hi, I think I speak for every cynical person in this room when I say that you've given us hope and that is no small thing. <laughs> Uh, also, I'm Sarah Messenger with KPFK Rebel Alliance News. Um, and yeah, and um, two things. Um, one is, as I'm sure you're aware, the wealth disparity in this country is just atrocious and beyond belief for those of us who've lived through more equitable times, let's say. Um, uh, and when this country had a thriving middle class, um, the ratio of CEO salaries to lowest paid employee was approximately 10 to 1 or 12 to 1 in all industrialized nations. Um, last time I looked, which was several years ago when th things were considerably better, that ratio was 452 to 1. <laughs> um, I've become very frustrated when I hear people who I otherwise agree with talk about minimum wage because it's a completely bogus concept because the dollar, of course, is an empty box and, it, and its wealth, its value is completely, you know. Uh, yes, I know, there's the question. Uh, is there a feasible way that we could actually institute uh, some kind of, of wage ratios instead of talking about minimum wage? Because a, raise, a, a wage ratio would actually have meaning, whereas minimum wage does not. And the other thing I just wanted to say is I have the perfect campaign slogan for you. Um, I know you grew up where I did, but in honor of your family, let me see if I can pull this off. Kennedy, because he's wicked smart, <laughs> and all the other candidates are just wicked. <laughs> I will try that out on my team. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've never, uh, th that's the first I've ever heard of that concept. Um, uh, and it's I, my you know, idea. I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. I, I can't give you a good answer about it. Right, I didn't I think so. But I, we need to raise the minimum wage in this country. I think the most important thing is to get people, um, in, to get the price of housing lowered. Yes, absolutely. And because. You know what, and, and to get control of the Fed, which is now an instrument for shifting wealth upward, um, and to reestablishing sovereignty over the Fed and reestablishing transparency, because that is the biggest instrument. There's this huge stratification, which is an immoral stratification of wealth in this country. And you cannot, you know, every social scientist will tell you that if you have this huge concentration of wealth above and widespread poverty below, that configuration is too unstable to support a democracy sustainably. You know, we're, we, are, we are destroying our democracy by allowing this extraordinary disparities of wealth to continue, and we can't do that. Um, and uh, there are, there, you know, the, the, the way we need to focus on rebuilding our industrial base, 
when I, when I lived at a time called the Great Prosperity, ec economists and social scientists, a 50-year period after World War II, when we became the richest country in the world, we created a middle class in this country that became the greatest economic generator in the history of mankind. When I was a boy, when my, my uncle was in the White House, America owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. We were the biggest exporter in the world. We were larger in some years than all the other countries combined until 1971. And the main change that began, that launched that, um, that prosperity was the GI Bill and the other things that we did, the, the other instruments that we created at, immediately after World War II that put the entire American population into their own homes. Because if you own a home, you now have access to equity. You can borrow against that home. If you want to start a business, even a small business, like buy a sewing machine, you can do that. Or you can bet the home and go buy it, start a restaurant or a retailer. If you don't own anything, if you're stripped of equity, then you have no entree into the capitalist system. You're not part of it. You are just a serf. You become, you go from being a citizen to being a subject. And that's what's happening in our country today. We're not, we're no longer citizens. We're now subjects. And, um, and so I'm really focused on getting Americans into home and then reconstructing all of these other institutions um, that help build the middle class in this country, removing or allowing people to get out of their student debt, you know, to discharge it in bankruptcy, allowing them to, uh, making a, uh, uh, lowering the student debt so that it's no more than 7% of total income. Because we are now, we have tied our kids with an albatross around their necks where they, they'll never be able to participate in our, our economic system. And you know, this is all I think about day and night how do you rebuild the American middle class? And I have a lot of exciting ideas that I think will get bipartisan support. Um, and uh, but I'm looking for it. Thank you. Absolutely. But I hope you think about wage ratios. Thank you. Over the okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Elizabeth. Um, soy Latina, and I'm also a member of Gen Z. Um, I'm 17 years old, and this next election will be the first time that I'm going to be able to vote. So, um, I want to know what should, why should Gen Z, people my age, who are, it's going to be their first time to vote, why should they be voting for you? What makes you stand out among all the other candidates that are out there? Um, whether it's something that's going to be um, affecting our future, or what do you have to offer? Well, I would say, um, that, uh, number one, I am going to end the warfare state. And the, 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 biggest, the biggest drain on, the, on your hope for future is the trillions of dollars that we spend on war, you know, eight trillion dollars in the last 10 years, or 20 years. If we had kept that money at home, we would have been able to put every American uh, kid through college fully paid for, we would have been able to make the social security system in this country solvent for 30 years. We could have provided childcare for all American families so that they can go to work and we can pay the childcare off with the income the parents are now allowed to make when they're at work and they're paying taxes on. Um, I, and, and as I said, we could, we could pay off all the student debt in this country and do many other things. And the thing that's keeping us from doing that is, uh, is this addiction that we have to war. And you know, um, we spent, my, my, my uncle, President Kennedy, made a resolution that he was gonna keep the country out of war, which he did. And, and uh, we were, when I was a boy, the most beloved nation on earth. When I went abroad, and there were a crowd, a crowd that I saw in Krakow that gathered when they heard we were in town, a million people with tears running down their faces, coming just to touch my dad because he was an American. I saw the same thing in France and England. There are more statues to President Kennedy in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, more boulevards named after him, more avenues, streets. 
universities and hospitals than any other American president, and probably more than all presidents combined. We did that because he, made it, he said, I don't want kids in Africa and Latin America, when they hear about the United States of America, to think of a man with a gun. I want them to think of a, a, man, a, a person with a, a Peace Corps volunteer. I want them to think of the Kennedy Milk Program, which gave nutrition to tens of millions of malnourished kids. I want them to think of USAID and Alliance for Progress, which put America on the side of the poor. And, you know, when my uncle made a trip to, the, my uncle had two trips that he said were the favorite of his presidency, one to Ireland right before his death, where he promised the Irish people, I'll return in the springtime, which, of course, was a promise he couldn't keep. The other was to Colombia to meet President Yeres Capmarco, who was, in my uncle and my aunt Jackie's estimation, the most brilliant political leader they had met in their careers, and they had met de Gaulle, and they had met you know, uh, uh, all of the great leaders. They met Eamon de, de Valera, the George Washington of, of Ireland. But they said, Yeres Carmargo was the smartest, most brilliant, um, and the greatest strategist. And there were two million people who met my uncle, who came out to greet my uncle in Bogota. And uh, Yeres Carmargo said to my uncle in the middle of his speech, he said, they, he couldn't speak because the cheers were so loud. And he said to my uncle, do you know why they love you? And he said, no. And he said, because they think you put America on the side of the poor against the oligarchs and against the military. And you know, that's where America should be because that's good for our national security. It's good for our trade. Now, we spent eight trillion, the, the Chinese, took that playbook from my uncle, and they adopted it. So while we spent $8 trillion on wars over the past 20 years, bombing ports, bridges, schools, universities, hospitals, people, the Chinese have spent $8 trillion building ports, schools, roads, hospitals, and universities, and they are now have displaced us from the world leader. Uh, they are the biggest creditor now, China in almost every country in Latin America, almost every country in Russia and in uh, Africa. They've now created BRICS, which is an alternative to the American dollar. They didn't want to create it. We forced them to by weaponizing our foreign policy. There's now 11 countries signed up to BRICS, 90% of the oil in, our, in the world, 47% of the global population. They're about to take the, U, the dominance of the US dollar away from us. That is what your generation needs to be aware of, because that will make the Great Depression look like a cakewalk. And, um, and you know, the, what the Chinese do is they go to Ecuador. They build a road from the Oriente to, to the Playa, to the Pacific. And they, use, they secure that loan with the right to Ecuadorian oil production for 20 years, but they send in 5,000 engineers, 10,000 workers, and they live in Ecuador. They become part of that community, and they, and they learn how to do things. They learn how to their trade, and they teach other people. When I was a kid, Rice University in this country graduated 20% of the engineers on Earth, and if somebody wanted something built, a dam or road, they came to us. Guess what? Rice University now produces fewer than 1%. The Chinese graduate 1.4 million engineers a year. They place them all in jobs all over the world because they're not making wars. They're making peace. We have 800 bases. We have 800 bases. The Chinese have one. And they're eating our lunch. And, you know, we, we, if somebody asks America today to build a road in Mexico or Nicaragua or a canal, we can't do it. We don't have the engineering bench. We used to be the builders of the world. We can't do it anymore. And we need to check because all of our concentration is toward the one thing that we export really well, war and weapons. And it is draining our country. It, you know, Paul Kennedy, who's no relation to me, 
one of the great historians who teaches at Yale, has done an analysis of, every, of the decline of every empire in the last 500 years, and everyone was destroyed through the seduction of, of, of advancing its, mil, its military around the world, overextending its military, which drained the middle class, which destroys democracy, which turns us into an imperial nation abroad and a surveillance state at home. There's nobody else who's running who has the capacity or determination to unravel the empire abroad, bring that money home, and rebuild the middle class, including the kids your age. And that's the great question. Okay, we have one, we have time